<laughs> you want people that really genuinely see the problem to be complicit with the problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> like. <laughs> I'm Gil. Here with me today is William. Hey, y'all. Owen. Hey, Gil. And Lillian. Hey, Gil. Uh, Today's episode is the first installment in a series we are doing on the concept of utopia. We're beginning, appropriately, with the inventor of the term, Thomas More. More's utopia belongs to a tradition of social commentary that plays consciously with the boundaries of seriousness and farce. This genre of satire goes back to Lucian, whose classical Greek dialogues more translated into Latin, and which was exemplified in Moore's time by his close friend Erasmus's book, The Praise of Folly. There's a sharp taste for paradox here, and this tradition is sometimes aptly characterized using the Latin phrase serio ludere, to play seriously. I'm reminded of Marx's dictum in his early article, Comments on the Latest Prussian Censorship, according to which the correct way to treat the ludicrous seriously is to treat it ludicrously. There are many ironies in Moore's text. Most famously, the name of the foreign land, Utopia, is a Greek pun meaning both good place and no place. The name of the traveler who enthusiastically tells us about it, Raphael Hithlade, means purveyor of nonsense. Nonsense characters like Hithlade speak in the dialogue with a version of Moore himself. And in general, we find a curious blend of the real world with obviously even aggressively fictional people, places, and events. Then there are deep questions about Moore's intentions in writing the book. And here the ironies only multiply. Even Hithlade, Utopia's champion in the dialogue, admits that some parts of Utopian society are not ideal, especially when it comes to their religious beliefs and views on happiness. And the character of Moore says that many of its laws and customs are absurd. So what we've got here is a book titled On the Best State of a Commonwealth, in which the guy describing it thinks it's flawed, and which our authored insert character seems to reject as ludicrous. If we buy Marx's dictum, then the question is, what's the ludicrous thing that Moore is treating seriously by treating it ludicrously? Its farcical tone aside, the whole text is pervaded by a sense of genuine moral outrage. Here it's worth knowing a little bit about the historical context. Moore was born in the late 1400s in London and spent most of his life working actively as lawyer, judge, and politician. By 1504, he was a member of parliament. Uh, Among other things, he served as an advisor to King Henry VIII, which went well until it didn't. A faithful Catholic and an outspoken opponent of the Protestant Reformation, Moore refused to acknowledge Henry's ecclesiastical legitimacy as the supreme head of the new Church of England, for which he was convicted of treason and executed in 1535. But the direct causes of Moore's utopian intervention were above all rooted in the shifts taking place in the late 15th and early 16th centuries in the political economy of England. Most significantly, this period saw the rapid emergence of capitalist agriculture whose greatest and most socially disastrous avatar was the enclosures, that is, processes by which land formerly held in common and which formed the material basis for the subsistence agriculture of the peasantry, was forcibly privatized for commodity production. In his book on Thomas More, Karl Kautsky describes some of the key features of this transformation. Quote, The landowners found that the simplest way of expanding wool production was to claim for themselves the common lands which the peasants had the right to use. Not merely individual peasants, but sometimes the inhabitants of entire villages and even small townships were expelled to make room for sheep. Capitalism in agriculture meant the direct setting free of workers. In England, this process of setting free proceeded in its severest forms and hand in hand with the separation of the workers from the land from their means of production, 
a rapid concentration of landed property was going on. Nowhere else in Europe were the unfavorable reactions of the capitalist mode of production upon the working classes so immediately obvious as in England, end quote. So this is the social and economic background against which Moore writes Utopia. He's bearing witness to an aggressive form of what Marx calls primitive accumulation, processes of dispossession that create the conditions for the possibility of capitalist relations of production, which he sees producing masses of impoverished, unemployed peasants and workers. This is the context in which we find, for example, his characters debating the proper way to respond to the increasingly widespread crime of theft. Even if we agree that stealing is a moral failure of some kind, shouldn't the fact that the masses are being stripped of any real alternative to provide for themselves, that is, shouldn't material conditions be the real object of critique and condemnation? And again, why make these points, which I would call straight up historical materialist and inspiration, through the medium of an irony drenched dialogue about a fictional island called nowhere. Questions like this should hopefully let us talk a little bit about the role of imagination and fiction in critical social theory. So one last little bit of scene setting about the structure of the text and then I promise I'll shut up. Uh, book one offers a sharp critique of these and other features of English political economy and juridical practice in the context of a discussion about whether philosophers should even get involved in practical politics while book two takes us to the island of Utopia, whose most striking feature is surely still today, as it must have been when the book was published in 1516, its regime of communal ownership and the total absence of private property. But we might also draw attention to the Republican structure of its political constitution, its humanistic valorization of virtuous participation in public life, as opposed to the false nobility of vainglorious European aristocrats, or even its peculiar defense of imperialist expansion. But okay, I think that's plenty out of me. Uh, sorry that went on a bit long. I'll stop here and open it up to you all. I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say about this fascinating and provocative work. Thank you for that, Gil. That was a, a fantastic introduction. So I think you know, the first thought that I had while, while listening to you and reading this text is you know, um, I also believe uh, historically um, book two was actually was written first and then book one uh, was written. So why I find that interesting is you know, to get us going is so you know, there is in either the history of liberal thought, conservative thought, and leftist thought a notion that there's a tension between politics and utopia. And usually when utopia is getting castigated and, and dismissed, it is this idea of blueprints of a perfect society. So I was really surprised reading this for the first time. One, when you get the book two, it's not that the people in utopia are perfect. It is not even that it's a perfect society. There's slavery in that society. There's still crime. But, you know, what I found is really interesting is that most of the dismissals of Utopia's relationship to politics is as if people cut Utopia in half and they only responded to book two. But book one sets the stage for the question of, well, what is the best form of government? And two... What is the relationship between ideals and practical politics? And so, you know, what I thought was like really incredible about this text is that, you know, Moore wrote the blueprint first. And then it's as if he realized actually part of the philosophical framing needs to be, does utopia even have a place in politics? And it's Thomas More, the stand-in, who's telling Hithalidae, you need to advise a king, you need to advise a prince. And it's Hithalidae who's trying to say, no, that, you know, that way lies corruption, that way lies you know, compromises. And so you actually get a, a far more complex rendering of utopia that isn't purely about fantasy, but about actually making clear these tensions between how do you do politics that isn't simply capitulation to the status quo and politics that tries to actually endeavor towards some sort of social transformation. Yeah, one of the interesting things in this context is that like the whole first book, right, is Moore's character telling Hithliday, like, wow, you know so much. You know, you're so knowledgeable. Why don't you go like be a counselor and an advisor to a king uh, and actually, you know, make a difference? And Hithliday tells like basically like there's like three excurses, right? Three different versions of what that would look like in which in each of which he's like yeah it doesn't work it's a waste of time you know like you say that way lies corruption and more presents himself as a kind of much more like moderate 
realist. He's like, oh, there's a kind of indirect approach, you know, kind of work with where people are. Maybe you won't be able to produce the best, but you can mitigate bad effects. And Hithliday says, that's a waste. Like that's, that's already like a tilting at windmills. Mm-hmm. Which is just really fascinating, like the way that these characters are kind of situated in relation to each other on this question. I could, you know, you know, just to like you know, piggyback off of that, you know, I think you know, one more thing that, um, at least from my research on more, and you can get this from the, from the text. Another thing that's really important with you know, this uh, this conceptual tension, I would call it, that more struggling with between utopia and reality, if we want to put it that way, because you know, politics is usually understood as the art of the possible. That's Otto von Bismarck, I guess. Is you know, also more has you know, um, he constantly emphasizes the the importance of public opinion. And so mm-hmm. when, you know, the more stand-in is, you know, saying, you know, if you, you know, obviously you can't just ignore the context. You need to find a way of articulating, you know, these ideas, you know, as it follows what, you know, people, you know, are thinking, how they, you know, conceptualize things. And so something else that props you know, more is up to is how do you communicate your ideas from within the common opinion to make them effective? And so that's why he's trying to draw Hathaliday in, but Hathaliday, and you know, maybe a sort of modern question of this is, what is it those of us who do theory, what are we trying to do? And Hathaliday, if you know, we podcasters, is like, well, we don't get into the messy business of politics. We've got pristine ideals. <laughs> We've read our Hegel. We are good. But, you know, I just think that it's fascinating that built into the whole text isn't this idea of mere pure fantasy. It is about what is, how do you interarticulate social difference while knowing that you can't completely break from the conditions in which you find yourself. I guess I, I'm just kind of curious about, like, this way that people respond to the concept of utopia. So I'm, I'm reading this, and I think, like, Um, actually there's not like that much that I can like, not that much that's fantastical Mm -hmm. about (laughs) all of this actually. And some of it, you know, even Thomas More is like, it's not even desirable at the end of the day. So there's kind of this like thought experiment and I didn't, because, you know, this is my first time reading the text, so I just didn't quite understand some of the motivations for like the things that are in Utopia. You know, I was like, okay. Nido, you know, these aren't like the <laughs> desires of my age, if as it were, you know, so like, but it's not actually that fantastical. It resembles more like a kind of, uh, like a kind of pastoral feudalism that is not so unequal, that has this like kind of relative gender egalitarianism. People are, are sort of loyal and have common virtue and ethics. And I mean, there's just like lots of details, but Anyway, it's not that fantastical in a yeah. certain sense. And I just, so I guess I'd like to know what became so controversial about this, either at the time or in like the later history of, of thought. Like, why did it, why did the word utopia kind of stick and take on this legacy of fan, like fantastical thinking that it would later? And I just, maybe we should, if you guys want to pick up that train of thought, because I feel like, Part of what we'll do with the Utopia series is, I guess, kind of like prod at it. Why that? Why people think that? Yeah, I don't have a great answer to that, but I think something strikes me that's related, which is that because I had the same reaction that the Utopia book two, right, where the Utopia is actually elaborated and described, um, actually struck me as like incredibly and eminently reasonable. Most <laughs> of the proposals are just like kind of mundane things about emphasizing use value over, you know, other stupid, senseless forms of valuation that ultimately harm both individuals and society. But I think that one of the kind of literary geniuses of it is that it ends up making maybe retrospectively, right, book one, which is the social critique section, right, the section, to lack of a better word, the section where Moore takes on the insanities created by the enclosures and by the emergent agrarian capitalism. He makes those look totally absurd and crazy, right? Like, so he, he's describing, you know, people that want, people, people that are like totally dispossessed by the process of the enclosures that then want those poor people not to beg, 
right? Or things like that, right? The people that have absolutely outlandish, absurd, fantastical ideas about how a society should function. Like if you if you dispossess all these people, then and then you're like totally shocked when all of a sudden there are beggars, oh no, beggars. and oh, they don't geez. have the ability to subsist. I mean, you are operating on a totally fantastical, almost kind wow. of utopian view totally. of reality, right? Yeah. Like, and so like yeah. by the time you get to utopia and it's like, yeah, we should all kind of eat in the same mess hall and like, you know, gems are probably not really that valuable in the end. It just, we, we kind of attribute all these arbitrary, fantastical values to them. And like the idea that some people are more valuable because of the blood that they possess by virtue of their daddy or something. Like, you, I don't know. All that stuff looks really absurd. And the stuff that they're proposing in Utopia, the Utopian place, all sounds like, you know, fairly reasonable. Wow. Except for money, except for the exchange, what is yeah. it, doing without money and private, pro actually at the end of it, he kind of like comes around to the idea that actually I can't imagine doing without money and private property. Like actually I'm not even sure that's desirable. Yeah, but when they take a shot at the, 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 mon <laughs> yeah, the kind yeah. of moneyless egalitarian society, it doesn't sound like crazy, you know what I mean? It, it sounds like mm -hmm. a pretty anodyne form of central planning that might have its, you know, might have its like pitfalls, but also might have its virtues, just like, any mm -hmm. existing or any economic system does, you know? Yeah, yeah I guess I, I was just interested in the move he makes. I think you're right that he kind of makes the things that people are now rationalizing as like mm -hmm. a well-ordered society seem really <laughs> absurd. Yeah. And yeah. that's like basically yeah. what I think capitalist transformation is like. Like the last episode we did, I think Gil was like, wow, we have so more houses than people and they're like, and then people can't live in them. That is 70 so crazy. 70% of the food gets thrown in the garbage and, you know. Like, what are we doing? I mean, yeah, yeah. so there's yeah, this yeah, yeah. Um, complete, like, yeah, irrationality of the market that goes on. And he's starting to see that. And I think it's, like, rhetorically very powerful to be, like, to kind of have the contrast between the two books, draw that out, you know, in a kind of literary way. But then at the end of it, when he, like, like when he, his interlocutor, who's... What is what was his name? Starts with an H. A uh, Hithalidae. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. So, yeah. so, so like when he comes to the end of his dialogue, and Thomas More is kind of like, there is much to be commended in this place of utopia, but also like the things I kind of can't imagine doing without are exactly the things I made seem absurd <laughs> yeah, in the yeah, beginning. Yeah. Which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, that is brilliant. So yeah. I want to say two things about that. One is that Skinner, Quentin Skinner's got an article that talks about like the sort of literary structure of the text and like w some of the things that are going on here. And at the end of both book one and both and book two, we have the more character saying, as you, as you point out Lillian, like, yeah, but like communism, like absence of private property, that's bananas, right? That can't, that can't work. But he points out that like the articulation of this at the end of book one is like much more confident actually in tone. If you compare them side by side, where like after we've been talking mm -hmm. about like he first kind of just like mentions mm -hmm. the utopians and he's like, mm -hmm. I'm convinced we could never have a properly well ordered society so long as there is private property for all the all these obvious reasons. And he's like, oh, that can't work. And he basically reiterates like the arguments that we get mm -hmm. against propertyless moneyless societies that uh, are first articulated by Aristotle. Actually, that is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this like Aristotelian claim is twofold, right? Like on the one hand, like without the promise of gain. Right. People wouldn't work and they'd fall to like idle sloth. And then second, we'd have like this sort of fall into social disorder. And then the two the structure of the two books, right, is first to be like, hey, uh, you know how you said that if we didn't have private property that like we'd fall into disorder? Look at the disorder right now. We've got your private property. So <laughs> how's that supposed to work? Right. And then second, now that we've talked about utopia, like seems like they're doing OK. They don't have these things. So this two pronged argument doesn't quite line up at the end of which he still wants to repeat the argument. Be like, surely we still need private property. But he's also like couching it now a little bit. Right. If you look at the end of book yeah. two, he's like, well, we wouldn't be able to have all those things that, according to common opinion, are really important. And it's like, oh, according to common opinion. Okay. Well, yeah, wait, I thought I thought you believed it. Like, wait, yeah, where did yeah, this yeah. come from? Like he's, yeah. he's 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 shaken a little. I think he's shaken. He's shook. But yeah. He's shook. He's shook. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, he ha he should have been. He should Henry, be shook. Yeah. Henry VIII and him did not did not get on. So you know. Yeah. I mean, oh my. So okay. Also, like, 
Owen, I loved what you said because you know, it just like you know, really crystallized for me that you know part of the structure of what Utopia is doing here is actually showing, and I think this is the kind of language you're using that actually the present society is underwritten by utopian thinking. Mm -hmm. The idea mm -hmm. that you can have an increasing dissolution of the commons, and from what I've read, you know, it seems like actually the consistent thing that Moore thinks is that the commons is necessary if you are going to have a healthy society. And a that you know, all this folk, a commonwealth, a commonwealth, and, and you know, increasing what we share in common. And that you know, what part of the critique of Utopia Book 2, we, the reason why he constantly talks about virtues and vices is more thinks that there are particular types of vices, especially private vices, mm -hmm. that tend to dissolve the commons. That's why, mm -hmm. look, let's just talk about some of the weird shit. Like, yeah. before a man and a woman get married, they have to be able to <laughs> see each other <laughs> naked. And you know, and I mean, you know, that's key. The Utopia <laughs> The like, problem is, Will, is that what you hiding? What the problem is is that you <laughs> totally believe that. That's totally consistent with like modern sexual ethics. We don't think you should get married without seeing each other naked. Yeah. <laughs> Facts. Yeah, but I think it, it's a little it's a little <laughs> bit weirder insofar as it seems like it's not like, hey, I'm attracted. He's just like, we are about to enter into this contractual agreement. Let me look over the wares. And so Well, there's nothing erotic about it, right? It's yeah. just like bare observation of each other's bodies <laughs> before you before you assume. <laughs> Sent to marriage, you know. Like, yeah, and, uh, the way that, the way he, the example he I'm gives just saying, is the way you look for fifteen sixteen. It's kind of a <laughs> kind of progressive, progressive move. Well, it's yeah. pretty risque. Yeah, yeah. He says like you know you don't buy a horse without looking it over. So. <laughs> exactly. He's just like you <laughs> wouldn't do that. So like, why would this be different? What what are you doing? <laughs> and so it's just like it's fascinating to me that the the move of utopia here is actually it's not just about denaturalizing the present. It's showing that the expectations we have of the present given how we order our common life mm -hmm. are completely fantastical yeah. and yeah. so and the problem nice. is common opinion is trapped in that deadlock of renaturalizing what actually is impossible and so sometimes mm -hmm. i don't get like the the knee jerk you know and and i guess as we go on with the series we'll see maybe how utopia has changed and critiques of it i don't get the critique of utopia as simply about impossibility when what more mm -hmm. rather cannily does is he says the present is impossible you know you yeah. dispossess yeah. all these people and you expect them not to develop the vice of stealing of pillaging another example of that is like the kind of impossible fantastical philosophical anthropology that some of the interlocutors are operating on right when they talk about how to punish theft so as to, you know, um, avert, uh, what's the word, uh, deter, like, thieves from thieving. I mean, it becomes clear in the text that, like, the people that think that if you just keep increasing the penalty, <laughs> that somehow, the, like, people will, yeah. that somehow, like, it will, uh, you know, people will adapt and it will, will actually be effectively deterred from thieving. And yet it never seems to happen, but they just so stubbornly commit to the idea that if, if, if we just start putting them all to death, Right, and even in the face of <laughs> overwhelming evidence that killing thieves is not reducing theft, they're still holding to this impossible, like wow. presentism. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, he wrote this in the 16th century. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. This is like at the beginning of the the first excursus where he's talk. Hithliday in book one is talking about when he's like at the court of John Morton, right? And like some guy is like. Ah, oh, you know, I love what you guys are doing with the thieves around here. Boy, you're hanging them 20 at a time. It's so tight. <laughs> and then he's yeah, like, yeah. it's so surprising. God, it's so surprising, though, that there's still all these thieves. And Hithliday's like, you moron. Of course, what are you talking about? Like, you've addressed none of the underlying causes of the this conditions, social ill. The, the yeah. conditions that create theft necessary still exist. They're still so there. you are a fantastical utopian. You know what I mean? And you like, just that, to spell yeah. it out, because it's obvious, if... You know, you say the penalty for thieving is death. Yet if I don't thieve, I will starve to death. It is yeah. really unclear yeah. why <laughs> that punishment would be a deterrent yeah. for theft. Nice. And yeah. So I, I wonder if there's another thing going on here. So like, you know, in book one, you're speaking of sort of fantastical ideas. You know, Hathaliday for, you know, all we can like, you know, kind of slam Hathaliday for like, you know, not wanting to get engaged in politics. But it's very fascinating to me that the one model of engaging in politics that the Thomas More stand in puts forward is the role of advisor to a prince or a cardinal, basically speaking to the powerful. And it seems like Hathaliday has his number there where he's just like, 
let's like run through a couple scenarios <laughs> where you think I'll be able to influence go? the powerful against their interest for the greater good. And so there also seems to be, and I, you know, it's really weird Thomas More making this critique, I think, because I think you said about this in the introductions. Thomas More, while he was writing this, was weighing whether he was going to become an advisor to a king. And it seems like in book one, it's like, they're actually, that way lies your execution. <laughs> like, you know, like, that doesn't <laughs> yeah. work. And so why do I think that's fascinating is because even in this present moment, there's still this dominant form of politics that the way you create social changes, you just got to get into the ear of the powerful. You just mm -hmm. got to become oh an advisor. Yeah. And all the way back in, I think, what, 1516 is when, when this came out. The following is like, no, you will just be bent by the social forces of the powerful because there is not in their interest to listen to these critiques that was fundamentally rearranged. And so I also thought there was this like really interesting critique of how political change happens and you know, what you should expect from it. That's, again, it's fantastical. To think that mm -hmm. simply telling the powerful a good story is the way to go. Having a seat at the table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having a seat at the table. Uh, if we want to do Hamilton, being in the room where it happens. Like, you know, yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that doesn't work. And I think that that's, that's fascinating because we already also have a, a critique of a mode of government that relies on kings and queens. I'm not saying that Moore was a, a Democrat. I, I think you know, we have to leave him in this historical you know, situation. He's not everything that we want. But there seems to be, you know, sort of meta critique of, you know, that is not the way a well-ordered society should be organized. Yeah. So can I, I want to say something about that, because Kautsky actually said some really insightful things about this, this point that you're making, Will, which is that he, he sees what's, you're right, he sees what's like doomed about the like having a seat at the table whisper in the prince's ear approach, right, pretty clearly. Mm -hmm. And I think he's correct about that. But and this is part of his like historical circumstance, right? Like there's not at the time an alternative way of env envisaging or imagining something like a proletarian uprising or like, you know, mass worker movements or anything. It's not an it's not a thing like their elements of it don't even really exist yet. Like proletarianization is just kind of getting underway. So like this is the sort of to use the language like derisively the kind of bad utopian or fa fantastical idealist part of the program in the book is like how did utopia get founded just like a really dope prince thought communism was a good idea right and his name was <laughs> Utopus yeah and he conquered that he conquered the island right yeah, yeah yeah he conquered the island and then he's like all right we're doing it like this now you're gonna have <laughs> x number of households and it's not gonna be more or less than this and we'll move stuff around and then we'll have you know mess halls and whatever, what have you, we'll all wear the same clothes, everyone's down, um, right? But like, that is that down. is also a fantastical, in a kind of like pejorative sense, thought, right? But like, the conditions were lacking for him to be able to imagine otherwise, right? So like, the way that Kautsky puts it is like, the utopian pejorative sense element isn't the end society, it's the ideas about what the means to that society would be, which are just sort of absent. So he can point to like, mm. what's wrong with the, the 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 whisper into the prince's ear model, but doesn't doesn't really know what the alternative is, and yet he's like anyway, like I don't know how to get there, but wouldn't this be sick? And then indeed, as you as you describe <laughs> yeah, Owen, it be like, sick? <laughs> and then as you describe Owen, like lays out some pretty reasonable sounding stuff, actually. <laughs> yeah. What can I ask you all something? So so since we've already done an episode on like your know, Machiavelli and all of that, so nice. something uh, I, I can't remember if you brought it up in in your your introduction, Gil. But you know another thing that really marked um, uh, Thomas More is that you know he came of age during the War of the Roses, and so apparently he was you know something that really animated him was the worry of society dissolving, a society constantly in crisis, falling apart. Why do you think? Thomas More comes to, even though we gave our radical reading of Machiavelli, I think that this is a rather different answer of how to resolve the problem of a society in crisis. That he, he seems ambivalent about the idea of you need a strong sovereign, even though Utopus is a sovereign that just shows up, but then kind of like abdicates his power, just like, look, I set up the good society for you all, go for it. <laughs> and so what I think is interesting here is that we also find two figures who share um, a relatively common historical period 
coming up with radically different ways of how to resolve the problem of the crisis of the commons, of the crisis mm -hmm. of, a, of shared social life. And so I was wondering what you all thought about that because you know, Machiavelli is like, yeah, that's pretty scary, so we're going to need to deal with factions. While Moore is like, well, what we need to do is uh, deal with this problem of money and poverty, and that seems like the way to go. To me, that's, no, I mean, I think that's interesting. I don't have that much insight into it, except for that just strikes me that these are actually pretty, like, different historical conditions. Like, if I think about, like, 16th, 10th century Florence, like, the problem, you know, like, in the Republican episodes, like, or, sorry, the Machiavelli episode, like, the thing we were talking about was, like, you know, like, protecting the city-state was, like, top priority. Like, this is his main, like, funding it, protecting it militarily. Like, there's a, that's, like, the political context. Mm. And then the transition to, like, an agrarian form of capitalism is actually a pretty different one. And I actually, like, had this thought while reading it that um, I think Marx is really right that, like, the conditions for this kind of thinking emerge very distinctly with capitalist society. Like, the material conditions make it possible so that you can think about social organization in this different way, in a way that you couldn't before. Because suddenly you're, like, hit with these kind of macro developmental patterns that like are not only making you question whether or not they're rational but clearly you have the means to do it like the way that he talks about we just have all of this labor productivity isn't that amazing like we don't mm -hmm. like if we trade with people and they steal our shit it doesn't matter because we produce so much stuff at home you can only talk about that in a context in which the home market is clearly forming in england and you're like Wow, look at how much stuff we can make. We don't need to develop on other, depend on other places. I mean, like, in theory, mm -hmm. isn't this amazing? And, like, so there's just something kind of, like, I, I really like the contrast because, actually, I, they're pretty different ideas about, um, like, the direction so they want politics to, to go in. I really like that comparison. I'm just trying to think through it um, because it seems weirdly, like, Utopia, if you juxtapose it with The Prince, right, Machiavelli's The Prince, it seems like more of like a critical text, even though it appears to elaborate with like a great mm -hmm. specificity, a whole social arrangement that, you know, an ideal social arrangement. I think like based on some of what we've said already, it makes sense to think of the text as, and even the utopia that's created as, as critical reflexivity on the present. Mm -hmm. Whereas the prince is, even though it doesn't lay out an, an ideal set of social conditions, actually has a much more programmatic like, you know, Althusser describes it as a manifesto. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that distinction is is helpful or not, but I think that, that it is, I don't know, it just strikes me that the supposedly fantastical one, you know, is, is meant to have a, a critical reflexivity in relation to the present. And the prince mm -hmm. is the... Yeah, I don't know. It's the, yeah, it's the no, no. Text. Oh, and I love that. Um, let me just say this real quick yeah, because yeah. you know, I'm, I'm I'm writing a public facing piece about this because you know, what you find is that the the way to cascade utopia is to say that it actually doesn't tell us anything about empirical reality. You know, the idea that it's an, it's a flight from reality. But what's yeah. interesting, and not to say Machiavelli falls into this, but it turns out perhaps a brute real politique, a brute idea of you know, a, a pure science of politics might actually be more utopian in the bad way than you, utopia mm -hmm. as a critical reflexivity on one's historical moment, which mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. builds off what Lillian was saying. Was like, what's fascinating with your know, utopia here is that it is historically emergent. It come it emerges in history rather than it being abstractly posited outside history, which is you know the way you could critique like Plato's um, uh, Republic, and so you know Moore is obviously aware of Plato's Republic, and so what he tries to do to show that what he's up to is different than Plato's Republic is. Part of the reason why there's the, the I believe in the, the text you have, there are the maps and there's all this granular detail, is we know it's a literary text, but Moore is saying, no, this is a real historical place. Mm -hmm. While Plato's just like, let's just imagine a city, okay? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, let's yeah. just like, you know, let's just work out the arguments. And so the difference is for, for Moore, utopia is then you have something with a historical genesis. It emerges mm. from mm. real contradictions oh, nice. that need resolving. Oh, interesting. And I worry that this idea of you know, is utopia or realism, what, you cannot make the argument that you know, simply being realistic isn't a way of simply bowing before present circumstances rather than understanding. And hypostatizing them, freezing them, yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah, I mean that's you know I kind of think of it. I think that they're both, I think they're both attacks on the fantastical. Weirdly, mm. like Utopia and the Prince are like both attacks on the fantastical way of understanding the present. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm gonna sit with that for a minute, but yeah. Well, like when like at the end of these examples that Hithlidae gives about how trying to get involved in politics and trying to influence the discussion would inevitably fail, which might be, by the way, like there's something to be said for like reading kind of paradoxically there, then like that's more and Machiavelli, the fictional character more and Machiavelli on the same team, right? Being like, get in there, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. do your, do your sort of influencing work, try to like shape the direction of things. It's Hithlidae who says like, the line is really good. He says, the only result of this is that while I try to cure the madness of others, I'll just end up raving along with them myself. Right. Like, and like, that's what happens <laughs> yeah. when you, that's what happens when you play the real politic game here without utopian critical sensibility, I think is the suggestion, right? You're like, true. uh, yeah. that there's like something crucially missing, um, and, and, you know, maybe corrupting it's it, the whole, like the whole, like, well, the risk that you end up simping for the Medici's, you, you know? end up simping <laughs> for the Medici's and they're not, they're not great. We can admit, right? The Medici's, <laughs> it's okay to say that, it's okay. <laughs> but it, it's so, it's so like ambivalent in the text for me. Like, I'm still not exactly sure, like where more the, the writer, I guess, not the character perhaps, uh, sits on this question of like, what is to be done in terms of like, you know, trying to influence the direction of public affairs, like the critiques he gives of what it's like to try to influence power are so good. And by the way, so fucking funny, just so funny. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. like at the end of the whole thing about like, uh, punishing thieves, right. Uh, Hithlidae is like, Hey, what if instead we did this other thing, which it's like, by the way, like penal labor, like forced labor for the for the convicts, right? It's like a convict leasing system, which again, sweet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But he's like, he says all this, you know, about how like, look, you know, whatever vices this might have, at least it's trying to like make restitution to the people who have been harmed and like attack the sin and not the sinner, et cetera, et cetera. And immediately all the counselors, the king's advisors are like, that's ridiculous. Uh, it's awful. You're an idiot. Uh, that goes against the laws of the land. But then the cardinal, he's like, actually, that's not a bad idea. And then all the counselors are like, yeah, it is a pretty good idea, actually. <laughs> like, we all think so, too. <laughs> like, they're all sycophantic, you know, vicious, you know, gibbering idiots. What, what a complete slam on all people who tend to, like, moths to the flame, draw themselves to power. Like, I love mm. that moment because it's, it's so like, funny. none of these people are principled. No. Are you kidding me? <laughs> It's more appropriate than ever. I mean, we have whole massive industries of these folks now, right? That that's in various NGOs and advising roles think or tanks. whatever that think that they're that think tanks and um, you know that just are convinced that you know with their pro it's best for them to have the proximity to to power. <laughs> they intend well. I mean, sure, they're probably not going to do a lot. You got to work within the confines of the, of the market and reality. But like, <laughs> they're at least it's better for if they're it's better for them to be getting rich in those jobs. <laughs> You know, because they at least have the good because, to be ineffectual, and, yeah. No, because I'm just at least they have their better, proper intentions. It's better for for us to be getting rich at these jobs because why the fuck would I care if someone else is getting rich at it? Yeah. It's better yeah, yeah. if it's me. <laughs> you want people that really genuinely see the problem to be complicit with the problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you, you, like you don't want people being complicit with the problem that are just like fucking totally ignorant, have no idea what's going on, bumbling around, and having a good time. Oh my god! You want you need guilt Holy and you shit. need some sense Owen of clarity. Owen fucking about killed that. me with that. Oh boy. You, you really want people who really see the problem to be complicit, not someone who's ignorant. What? That's that's, that's the dream. I think that's I think that's the dream for a lot of folks who are in the like professional social improvement class. You know. Uh, <laughs> Stop. <laughs> oh, fuck. Uh, Owen got back to Toronto and he's just got bangers today. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I love that. I hadn't thought of the professional social improvement class is Oof. the best way of describing this. <laughs> it's, a, it's a subcategory. The third, se of the the third sector is yeah, super I, lame in yeah. comparison. I love the name of the course, it's just simping for power. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How to be exactly. your best simp. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, our Medici simps don't write books like the Prince. But, you know. 
<laughs> like, they again, don't. like so much has fallen off since we exited the 16th century. It's just like uh, it's it barbarism. Kind of, you know, but yeah. it, this is what you know, Adorno called it. Looks like, Hilarious. but yeah, exactly. You know, the other, you know, what else is really rich about you know more? We can call it maybe more sort of social ontology is that, you know, he also wants to show that a disordered commonwealth, and maybe you could say that there are reflections of this in, in Plato, really produce disordered, vicious individuals. And so, like, you know, there's also this scaling where even, you know, if you want to make the claim, like, you know, the, the, the ideal or the value of the individual isn't really historically existent at this point, it is quite clear that Moore is very interested in what happens to the individual's character. And he wants to say that, you know, you shouldn't be shocked at the simps for power when you have a fundamentally dysfunctional and disordered society. And so I don't know if that makes mm -hmm. it so you're more sympathetic to the simps or not, but <laughs> you know, at least it's not like, you know, you know, there's something definitely individually wrong with them. He wants to, you know, to show that even if you come in with the best intentions, it will distort your values. It will distort, if we understand virtue as knowing how and when to act, it will fundamentally recalibrate mm -hmm. you know, your understanding of what successful action is. I mean, I think this is totally on, I don't know if this is even on the right train of thought, to be honest, but I just like think about like the virtue, the, the moral virtues of like the, the NGO world the professional social improvement <laughs> class, like these, I, to be honest, and I like, I really hope I don't offend any of our listeners because I understand you can't help but work for these people. Every every job is probably a nonprofit jobs, job. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yes, but like honestly, I feel like the ideological like commitment you have to have to like do these jobs, like the the means of rationalization are so extremely mm -hmm. heightened. Like mm -hmm. there's the, even the way that they talk about politics is so insidious you know like rules for radicals and community organizing and everything I mean and then we wonder like why all of like the language that like was once a part of like left-wing movements is now being echoed in the highest echelons in the state on like MSNBC <laughs> and by the CIA I mean like <laughs> this is crazy stuff and you know they it really does distort sorry distort so like Mm -hmm. This is like a part of the fantastical world that we're all like, yeah, anyway. Wait, wait, wait. I just want to build off the CIA thing. You all have seen that commercial. I think it was like months ago. I, I made I made jokes about it when I was back at back oh, at Wesley. Oh, yeah. The CIA put of out a course. commercial and like, you know, I think yes. it was like you know, uh, a, a Latina woman and like with a sweatshirt that said intersectionality or something. And, you know, oh and, my God, and I she's forgot walking about the in <laughs> and I was just like, yeah. And you, know, this ain't your daddy, CIA. <laughs> Like I'm just like, what? Where are we? What? <laughs> Tell me that's not the most utopian in the pejorative sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The most yeah, utopian like, commercial. Like, are you the most utopian this, work of culture this, in yeah. history? Is this the change you can believe in? Is this yeah. practical <laughs> politics? You change it from the inside. Like you know, you know, it's, it's like made real. Those memes of now we drop bombs with rainbows on them, except. It's like people in power really do believe this, though. And, you know, well, see, that's what I'm saying. That's what makes it so dangerous is I actually do think that, like, the, 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 the people who work in this sector, the number of them that are actually cynical, I think, is significantly lower mm. than people who work in other sectors. Mm -hmm. Because mm. I think that, like, it's labor of love. It's, the, like, the language of it. It's, like, they d get to apply the language that you get that you learn in your university classroom and you're able to have a life that's like morally consistent in a certain way. And I think that that's like kind of a strong hold on people psychologically, yeah. which makes criticizing it very difficult, like very difficult. So if, even though it's completely dystopic that like the CIA is doing that, it can do that because there's so many other large scale organizations that do the same <laughs> so that in a certain sense, it looks like, what's the word, uncanny to see it in the CIA? But that's only because it's being, repli you know, I guess, mm -hmm. is it this mimesis? Maybe I am an, an Adorno guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but Maybe I've talked I, myself into it. I can't so wait for our Adorno episode. Yeah, we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah. Wait, okay, so actually this lit. is super helpful because it makes me, I think I like the ruminants of an answer to a question that Owen asked a long time ago here, which is like, you know, this actually feels pretty reasonable. Like, how did this become 
to how did this come to be thought of as like utopian in this like you know pejorative sense of like fanciful fic like bananas uh like even at the time of his writing this right like kind of witnessing the nascent like emergent capitalist order communism was you know in in you know pre-modern forms a respectable relatively respectable theoretical position in lots of humanistic discourse uh, which was you know championed mm -hmm. by, it, you trace its roots back to the republic where sure goods are held in common only by the guardian class but then in the laws where it's pretty generalized across society and then in plutarch who also advocates for a sort of communal ownership and the abolition of private property so like even at the time he's writing this like it doesn't sound that in, like that ridiculous but then like over you know what's it been four or five hundred years since then the the depth with which like capitalism gets its claws both into the social order and then also like our imaginative space right it becomes retrospectively fantastic it becomes retrospectively mm. yeah. fantastical right it looks it yeah. looks more unreasonable to us now than maybe it did when he wrote it even because of the way in which like our sort of imaginative our imaginative horizons are so circumscribed by like obviously it's necessary that we have to have private property in precisely this form mm -hmm. in which productive forces and relations are ordered for the sake of extracting profit through commodity production like that's just all we can imagine anymore so then you get these like 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 you said Lillian very non-cynical people who want in fact to do better and to improve things, but who don't see that the circumscription of their horizon has taken place, right? And so they think mm -hmm. that like the only- Including all of its absurdities and insanities totally. that you now have to accept as the reasonable- Immutable given, Measured frankly. position. Yeah, yeah as immutable yeah. Like givens. literally trying to create, in quotes, radical change <laughs> by doing everything but challenging the capitalist class <laughs> yeah, to do yeah. anything, like, which is that's, that's what the NGO sector is about. And so then like, that, I mean, I'm just going to like go say this one more time and because I actually think it's kind of peripheral to the conversation. But once I got going on the NGO thing, I couldn't stop. So it's like there is this whole conversation like in academia and in like left wing circles about, you know, the margins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then mm -hmm. what happens is that institutions that are actually on the margins and their position in the economy is literally to contain politics on the margins, start valorizing the margins as like hmm. the way of doing, like these are the people that we're doing this for. I mean, you don't see that horizon close off right in front of you. It's like you've learned to think about the margins and we are on the margins and now there's something virtuous about being on the margins. And the fact that like the whole point is for the margins to attack the center gets like lost and then you're like. <laughs> no, you're supposed to make money off the margins, good salary. And then you don't even know that that's happened to. I mean, like, yeah. it's wild stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this. So there are, like, two things that I want to say. So I'm going to build directly off of what Lillian said and then build off of what Gil said. One, the reason why, you know, you all, because you, you were in a group chat, I got in my feelings when I just sent off my little two-sentence tweet about, non-ironically, I just think for have a coherent politics, you need utopia. And then I have, like, you know, these big accounts of these blue checks coming at me. And one, I don't know how you know what I think from a two-sentence tweet, but clearly <laughs> you project all of this stuff on the utopia. But you know, to build yeah. on what, what Lillian said is, I do think it's disastrous if you think a coherent politics is containing utopia. When, when Moore is talking about utopia, it is always about understanding how it will relate to existing structures. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you repeat this idea of cordoning it off and you know, naturalizing present conditions. But you know, to go off of, uh, of something that Gil was saying with you, know, the sort of the retroactive active, you know, fantastical is, you know, also a thing that we lost. Like, you know, again, I am not saying, you know, Thomas More was a perfect man. Like, boy, if you, if you are Protestant, <laughs> Thomas More was not a perfect man. Yeah, that like, dude let's be might okay. have, that dude might have actively <laughs> tortured people, okay? He, 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 he <laughs> oh, may have. Kind of we, unclear. You know, he says he didn't, <laughs> but there are a lot of allegations yeah. flying around. But uh, look, Lutherans, there are two, not, there, yeah, there are two wolves inside you. Okay. Um, <laughs> Hell yeah. Boy. Owen. Um, Owen and I are together. <laughs> on this. I, I'm a little bit more ambivalent. I want to, like, you know, I want history to look kindly Long on Long live the counter reformation. <laughs> yeah, oh, fuck yeah. 
Greatest but tragedy in history. <laughs> more does belong to a humanist tradition that, you know, we can call it woo-woo, but it was this humanist tradition that understood that every human being necessarily does have equal value. The problem mm -hmm. is we live in, uh, and I think in Moore's time, what we call real life. This isn't real life. These are artificial you know, structures that you know, obscure the truth of our common humanity. The mm. idea of a shared common humanity, no matter what you say, I do not think that that is even today the dominant ideology. <laughs> it might not be you're born, you know, a lower class, but boy, the market sure does sort people out. And like, there are winners and there are losers. There are people who will not, will have to do with less and people who do with more. And so the fact that somehow that became the dominant in ideological space, it's, it's fantastic in, in the bad way. It's fantastic. Right. And mm -hmm. so there is something that was deeply lost. And so that's why it can sound weird arguing for things like universalism and truth, because it's as if we've been so saturated with the idea that there must be intrinsic differentiation of species, of humanity, of roles. And so that's why I find it like really helpful going back to this 16th century text being like, dang, there's like a type of clarity here that sometimes I don't think we have in 2022. Like, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, didn't, isn't something that he said to the common humanity point, wasn't the reason that you don't have, utopia doesn't have treaties with other peoples, like treaties, like the existence of making, like making treaties means that you assume that you're all, already at war, <laughs> already like that hostile, you have to make yeah. treaties. And he's like, this is undermining common humanity and like the natural law, U utopia wouldn't do stuff like that. It's kind of an incredible thing to say. It's also his argument about why utopia has few laws because it's virtue mm -hmm. that holds them together. Yes. The, the other place treaties comes mm -hmm. up is in the second excursus from book one where they're talking, where Hithlid is like, what if I were trying to like advise a prince on whether and how to like, go to war and it's basically a kind of restaging of like the relationships between like France and England in relation to like Scotland and it's like who do we try to like provoke into antagonizing who and how do we do this that and the other and it's like well we could also like try to like encourage one of the exiled royals to try to like bid for the throne and then parentheses like we can't overtly do that because it's banned by treaties it's like yeah we all know that in realpolitik yeah. right treaties in fact are things to like have in your pocket like well we could always break that right that's always provisional treaties are there for the loopholes of yeah. how you can get yourself out of a treaty yeah uh, Hobbes saw this well yeah i mean he hates treaties hated treaties for another set of reasons <laughs> we, it's a state we, of war, we stand right? a hobbs we stand up yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> i did want to like bring up one like funny thing this isn't a particularly like philosophically interesting point, but it's one of the funniest things in the whole text. And I just kind of wanted to, to throw it at you all, which is at some point he's like, well, actually one of the things that is nice is he's like, yeah, utopia produces surpluses. And then they like export their surplus to neighboring countries, which a percentage of which they just stipulate has to be given to the free. poor for free, which Incredible. first of all, yeah. yes, yes to that. Why the fuck not? Can the IMF read this? Yeah, like, please, right? Yeah. <laughs> but then the rest, he says that they, and the rest that they, they sell at like, you know, moderate, reasonable, not extortionate rates as a consequence of which they've ended up stockpiling a bunch of gold and silver. And he's like, and they know that they need to keep some of that around because what if they have a couple years of shortfall in the harvests or if they need to raise a foreign army? You're going to need to have some of this money thing that everyone else is so worked up about, right? Even though we don't give a <laughs> yeah, shit about yeah. it. And then the question, the practical question arises. This is the funny thing. But how to store all this gold and silver? Because we don't have coins. That's, we don't think it's stupid. And if you, like, hide it away in, like, a tower and lock it up, like, everyone in the society who doesn't use coins like this or money are going to think, like, oh, maybe there is something valuable about that stuff, right? Oh, maybe there is something about that gold. So what do we do? It's like, oh, we, that's what we make our chamber pots out of. They're just like shitting into pots what? of gold. <laughs> does he, does he, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that how they said they shame the people when they come from other islands that aren't Utopia yeah. and they show up with all their gold and all that? And then they're like, they show up on Utopia and they see that, oh, they're just shitting in their gold. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they start to feel super embarrassed. <laughs> and, you know, th shit. this is actually their like soft, uh, soft power diplomacy yeah. of how they get other neighbor <laughs> neighboring countries to be less obsessed with gold. Like, look at that. <laughs> I, I am. I I am now like 
non-ironically a Thomas More fan. Yeah. This guy oh, is rock, funny. Like, I, <laughs> you can, funny. I'm going to be honest. I didn't realize people were funny back in the 1500s. I thought, you know, <laughs> things are pretty dire. <laughs> Humor had to wait until like the 18th century, but that's really funny. <laughs> I mean, I think there's like, there's there, another thing that struck me about the contemporaneity of the text is like a lot of people have talked about um, the new enclosures as being like intellectual property, right? Taking this, the birth of this like digital commons, which exploded with the internet when the internet was cool for a few years, right? And then the progressive, and it's not just the internet, right? But all manner of intellectual property. Think about the the absurdity and the fantastical nature of what's happening with vaccine yeah. IP mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. right? That like people are convinced that if like, oh yeah, like it, we can somehow deny access to these vaccines without having new variants emerge all over the world and then like, you know, come back to bite us in the ass. And I, mm -hmm. I don't know, I see a really similar, like I see a really similar opening for the critical gesture he makes about what the enclosures are doing, the land enclosures are doing with private property in, seven, in 16th century Britain to, you know, IP, the IP enclosures that, um, you know, we've been existing under. If there's a central message of, of the text, and you know, and I, I really appreciate Gil saying, like, you know, the text is layered with ironies and jokes, and it's hard to know what more the writer thinks, what more the fictional character mm -hmm. thinks. But I have a hard time reading this text and thinking the unifying theme, if there is any, is the necessity of the common good. Yeah. And yes. that, you know, yes. the destruction of the common good, you should not be surprised. You might think it will only affect those who are lesser than or less fortunate. Eventually, we all pay for it. And so that's just what that's came like, my and mind. And that's a realist. That's a realist observation, yeah. right? That like I, the I commons so, yeah. is a necessary feature of like human existence. And that's not, that's not the, the utopian thing is not to valorize the commons. The utopian thing is to think that you can denigrate and destroy and carve up and privatize the commons. And that's not going to produce gigantic social disaster ultimately. Well, yeah, yeah. So like before, like, you know, it's not a, just a joke, right? Like his, 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 his like, I thought this was about a quote commonwealth. And then you want to <laughs> you want to break it up and have private wealths. And then you're like, oh no, what oh, happened? So what happened to the commonwealth? This is like not, a particularly deep insight at this level, you know, it's like, yeah, obviously. hundred yeah. percent. Uh, yeah. Can I yeah. just like make a quick comment yeah. on the, on the intellectual property thing? Like one of the like contradictions about our current regime of property laws and like juridical practices that I've been thinking about recently is the way in which the theoretical foundations and justifications of antitrust law and intellectual property law are fundamentally at odds with one another. They're like literally incompatible mm -hmm. or contradictory where on the one hand, like, Antitrust law is meant to prevent the formation of monopolies, right? Because, and it's usually a utilitarian sort of defense that is monopoly formation ends up being bad for the social good because lack of competition allows firms to extortionately set prices, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the other hand, we're like, oh, but then we also need to allow patents and intellectual property, which is a de facto monopoly, right? We're creating conditions of non-competition this is exactly why like medicine is as expensive as it is in the US, where like for 15 years at least, and then there's loopholes that allow pharmaceutical companies to extend these things artificially, the introduction of generics that would compete with these name brand drugs is disallowed, mm. right? And so this is like mm. a, an immediate contradiction in terms of like how like in our social ontology uh, expressed at the level of like the legislation, like. Wait, wait, which was it, right? Which is, which is it that we're interested <laughs> which in? Which way, Western man? Yeah, Come on. Which way, Western man? <laughs> and yeah. obviously, if you have any interest, like, like yeah, like in, from the perspective of like the defense of a common wealth or social good, like more, I think you're right, Well, like this is his central, his central obsession. Yeah, yeah like the IP thing is, is ridiculous. And especially insofar as we like, you know, uh, I saw someone on Twitter, and I forget who, I'm not going to get the name right now, say the other day, like, humanity shares a common epidemiological fate, was the formulation, which I really like. You know, like, yeah. you can't yeah. vaccinate yeah. some people and not others and be like, job done. It's like, no, <laughs> this is, that's not Did how it. this works. <laughs> yeah, common good or not at all. Now let's do global travel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't dispossess and not expect thieves. Yeah. No, it's all exactly. I'm just like really glad we started with this text. I think uh, this What is Utopia series is going to be a lot of fun. I, I think that maybe we kind of got to a preliminary answer of what is Utopia for more, but you know we're going to read a lot of different people with a lot of different answers. And so definitely, yeah, I, I can't wait Stick to around. go on this.
Should we have started with the Republic? Maybe. I feel like we... <laughs> uh, I know. It's maybe starting to should... feel like maybe. <laughs> I feel like we haven't on the podcast. Maybe this is something for listener feedback. Do you want to talk about Do you Play-Doh? want us to go back to the old, the old boy? We haven't done we haven't done any of the ancients actually. So That's true. Yeah. We so, can give it a go. So tweet us, tweet us, tag us if you want us tweet to do us play those. If, listen, tweets. if you want the Republic, let we'll us know. Let we'll, us I, know. We'll do it. Mm-hmm. If this is a threat, we will do it. This is a threat. <laughs> we will do it. <laughs> right. Well, I think that about does it for us today. Uh, new episodes of What's Left of Philosophy come out every two weeks wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on YouTube for videos and live streams. Just last week, we did a live stream talking about the state of the art of contemporary reactionaries with Ben Burgess and David Griscom, and it was just a blast. Uh, So definitely go watch that. Huge thanks to those guys for joining us. Uh, If you don't already, check out their excellent shows, Give Them an Argument, and Left Reckoning. Before closing out today, we'd like to take a minute to thank some of the people who are supporting the show on Patreon. We couldn't do this without you, and we're really grateful. Today's new patrons are Shannon J. Garland, Andrew Tran, Solmu Alias Antilla, Oliver Davies, Christian, Patrick Kadic, Thomas Clem, William Fidulo, Jules Taylor, Gabriel Nair, Nick Fishman, Alex Schiffman, Bam Aula, Lawrence McDonald, James Eaglesham, Molten Lava, Tom Hancock, Louis Kirvan, Chris Bacon, and Andrew McWinney. Thank you all very much. If you too like what we're doing and want to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash left of philosophy. Patrons get access to exclusive content like locked episodes and bonus videos. Follow us on Twitter at left of Phil, and don't forget to leave us good reviews and comments on your podcast app. So with that, thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.